everyone for coming. I'm Nikisa Edamod. I'm the regional VP of Metro Bay Area for LMDA and I'm a freelance dramaturg based here in San Francisco. And to my left are four amazing people of the Bay Area that have encouraged and supported dramaturgy in fundamental and I very important ways. Um, I just wanted to give you a little introduction that uh, this is the long-running duos at ACT and Shotgun Panel. And um, dramaturgy positions on theater staffs are becoming more and more rare. They've always been seen as a luxury item rather than a necessity, especially with our current government that threatens the arts on a regular basis. Uh, it's very admirable when theater companies choose to invest in and maintain a staff dramaturg. It's so amazing who employ them and also have long-term relationships with two decades with both of these pairs. <laughs> <laughs> You're as young as ever. It's all right. <laughs> we have some dynamic duos here in the Berkeley Rep has a duo. Crowded Fire has theater company. But today I will be talking with Carrie Perloff, Artistic Director of ACT, on my left, far left. And Patrick Dooley is the founding artistic director and dramaturg, Joni McBrien. Here's some fun facts. began in 1992 in the basement of Laval's Pizza Parlor. Not even on By 2004, two they had their own space called the Ashby, Ashby Stage. It became, in 2007, the first 100% solar-powered live theater in America. It's pretty phenomenal. <laughs> They also employ a, f a graphic artist named Rich R. Black, <laughs> who uh, it does all their artwork for all the shows, and his work is seen all, all over the marketing and website. And uh, he even comes every show and paints the outside of the building with that logo in, an, in a way that suits the shape of the building. ACT was founded in 1965. It's one of the largest theater companies in the nation. It has a three-year MFA conservatory acting program and a young conservatory. In the spring of 2015, they opened the Strand Theater, a new performance space complex that is playing a major role in revitalizing the central market neighborhood of downtown San Francisco. And they're able to do lots of new work there and the New Strands Festival has been launched and is a fantastic uh, new play hub. So both Shotgun and ACT are forces to be reckoned with in the Bay Area, as are these artists who are joining me today. I want to thank you and welcome everybody. So uh, let's start by getting to know your theater companies, your missions, and what you're all about, what sets you apart from other companies, why you do what you do. So let's take a look at ACT first. These are some production <laughs> Thank you. 
statement and what uh, ACT is all about? Um, oh, I, c I don't know that I could recite the mission statement, but it, um, ACT okay. has always okay. been uh, <laughs> what it means to you. Um, <laughs> a theater about the future. It's a teaching theater that was um, imagined by Bill Ball to be a place of lifelong learning where young artists were always mentored by master artists and um, great literature was done in relationship to new work. Um, it's um, an actor's theater, I would say. You know, it's very much about the art of transformation. Um, uh, it's always been quite international in its appetites. Um, and because it was housed from the beginning at the Geary, which is a thousand seat theater, it was um, uh, never a theater that was a home for domestic drama, which suited me fine. But, uh, you know, if you love. Um, Living room drama, the Geary is not your stage. You know, it's, um, it's a theater that asks for sort of poetic, muscular dramaturgy, um, language, um, physical, musical um, presence, uh, great acting. Um, and, you know, we created the Strand because we wanted um, an incubator space, um, not that was smaller or less ambitious, and it's not a black box. The stage is as big as the Geary. Um, I because I can't stand the notion that new plays are supposed to be in a closet and, and then classical plays get big spaces. So, you know, it has just that same scope, but it is to give voice to and room to all kinds of work that for a variety of reasons wouldn't land um, easily, you know, uh, at the Geary. And um, ACT is the only freestanding institution left in America that gives an MFA in acting, but that also has a really um, uh, profound... Um, educational component and a citizen artist component that trains young teaching artists to interact with many different communities. Fantastic. Thanks, Carrie. Um, Michael, is there anything you want to say about why you work at ACT? What, did it, what is it about the company well, that jazzes you? Maybe one thing. Well, <laughs> everything. I mean, yeah. you know, it, we, we do the kind of work, the a scope of work and, a, and the eclecticism of work that a lot of other regional theaters don't do. I think we aspire to do it at a very high level with really, really gifted artists. And you know, it's, it's always a good idea to be in a room where there are people who are smarter and better at what they do than you, because that's how you learn. And I have learned a vast amount in the 12 seasons that I've done at ACT. And I get to teach in our MFA acting program, uh, which I love. And um, so that's why I love to work at ACT, because every day is different. Uh, and every day, the uh, you know the the standards are high, and it's literature that I love to work on or see, and uh, I love teaching. And we have uh, M our MFA program is you know one of the best in the country, and it's a really privileged to be part of the team that teaches that. We see your graduates everywhere, <laughs> so there's good proof of that. And it must be rejuvenating to have all the young folks around you all the time. I think from the beginning, what has made ACT, s one of the things that makes ACT special, is the ACT special is the energy in the building that comes from young people. And it's young people from eight, you know, to however old our MFA students might be, but sometimes they're in their 30s. You know, but that energy, which really keeps you young and keeps you on your toes. And, you know, one of the things that teaching does is make you test what you know. 
you have to reevaluate yourself all the time. All the time. So you don't steer them the wrong way. <laughs> well, so that what you're teaching is, you know, is relevant and useful. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you, guys. So let's switch gears to shotgun. Should we do a little visual aids first? Sure. Tantalize the folks. Let's see. You've got about 20 photos of various productions. They'll just maybe, I don't know, four or five seconds per show. You can you guys read the title? Do you see it? Okay, great. Here comes Joni, left side, back row. Brings us to present day. <laughs> so, Patrick. Oh, that was so fun. <laughs> How do you feel? Did you like your photo <laughs> album? I do. <laughs> it's like we were so young and <laughs> we were, anyway. <laughs> um, uh, the, the same question, I guess. Yeah, yeah. yeah. What, what is it Shotgun all about and what sets you apart? Yeah. I always have a question like what sets us apart because I don't, I, I don't <laughs> often think, I, I saw that question, so I don't really think about it in those terms. Yeah, I guess. Yeah. Um, I mean, I think about, I mean, the, the great gift of having the opportunity to um, um, be artistic director or work at a theater company is that I have the opportunity every day to kind of to come and sort of reimagine what we want our work to be. And every season and every play is an opportunity to, you talked about learning. Like, I, I didn't study theater. I studied English and economics. But I always loved being involved in plays, and so I've I've often joked that running this theater company has been sort of my extended PhD program in theater. I get to learn about all these amazing playwrights, and I also, like Michael said, I mean, one of the gifts, uh, one of the a, co a conscious decision that I made, you know, a couple years in, is like I want to my is realizing that my job is not to try to be the smartest person in the room. I realized right away that was never <laughs> gonna that was not gonna be good for the work. And my job is really to surround myself with as many smart people as possible and be the champion of the, the, the best ideas that come up. Um, and I really see myself as uh, trying to fulfill that role and to create a space where people can come and, you know, it's funny, like, you know, we do, we have a small, we have a, our theater is a tenth the size, or not quite, you know, an eighth the size of, of, the, of their theater, but it's still, I also feel like I'm, I'm not interested in doing living room dramas either. You know, I'm really wanting to try to be to fill the space every time they come into their theater to say like, wow, I never imagined they, they could transform the space or transform the experience of being a uh, of seeing a play like this. And uh, you know, how can we do that? How can um, how can we you know using the work to challenge our audiences? I mean, just um, part of our mission is like how they can use the, the experience of theater to re to um, to look at their lives in a different way and, and the world around them. Like how do they walk out of the front door and think about their lives differently than they did? If they walk out the front door and the cold air hits their face and they're just on to the next thing, we have failed. But if they're still puzzling over something, if there's a nugget, if, you know, if we've made them uncomfortable in some way to have to reconsider something, then I feel like we've succeeded. You know, I'm not really interested in being a two-hour diversion. You know, I'm really interested in like how we can 
you know, tell a story that gets us to think about things differently. And, and I have to say that only because the most, some of the most important experiences of the things in my life were my grandmother taking me to see plays and you know, kind of having my world like rocked by that experience and how that shifted, you know, the way I, you know, was in relationship and then the way, you know, I, I mean, it, so I, I want to do theater like that, that does that. <laughs> we want to see theater like that. And I think also like how we can, and, and one of the things I'm really trying to get better and better at is like how do we foster a, a, um, a collaborative sort of spirit within the cast and within the staff, within the front of house, everything, so everybody sort of has a sense of ownership in the work. It's not just um, Patrick's Theater Company, that it's all of, it's everyone's theater company and, and that, that, that everyone is involved and, and is invested in that vision. That feels really important to me that we're, nurturing um, something like that. And that you know, then people br will bring their best ideas in because they know that that idea is going to be heard mm -hmm. and that idea is going to have a an opportunity to, to, to go somewhere. And so I think that it just, it just benefits the organization that way. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Something like that. Something like that. Yeah. That's, that's a good mission statement. Yeah. <laughs> so let's talk about why you guys are on staff here and wha what your positions are and how long have you been at the company, Joni? How long have you people working together? My first show with Shotgun Players was in 2000. I was the dramaturg for The Striker. Uh, so that was my first dramaturgy with Shotgun Players. I then ended up coming on board as the development director in 2004. So I've had a dual role, certainly my primary you know, important role for trying to raise money for the organization is as development of director. <laughs> yes, but here's the thing that's interesting about dramaturgy with development is that I feel like both sort of feed into each other and there are donors that know me as a dramaturg even though th I am the development director that's really they're in with me and it's they're in with the company and certainly if any of you are wondering well I'm really passionate about dramaturgy I want to work on shows I want to work with companies I will tell you that you ha already have a great gift if this is your interest that grant writing is also a natural segue for all of you because I can tell you I'm a much str the reason that Patrick hired me uh, for the development was because after working with him for three years and getting 40 pages of notes um, at times for shows he underst he knew that I, that I was very passionate about the work and that I could tell a story and that's far more interesting for companies. It's far more interesting in promoting the work is being able to tell the story and not making it uh, what I sometimes refer to as grant speak. Um, but I will tell you a quick story about the, my first experience in working with Shock and one of the things that drew me to work with the company. With Scriker, this is a very dense, uh, tricky text. It has three, s uh, three roles of, th uh, of characters that actually speak, and there are 20 characters based on Celtic mythology and uh, Celtic lore. So one of the things that I did was to sort of unravel part of that text, so it was a really wonderful experience in terms of research. But the other thing that was really different about working with Shotgun compared to some other companies that I had worked for with the dramaturg was how collaborative it was. And you know we all are going to be drawn to different things, but one of the first uh, rehearsals that I went to for <laughs> the Scriker, um, I was surprised that everybody was participating at all levels. So even though I was I was the dramaturg, I was invited to participate in physical warm-ups. That was something that was very different. Um, Patrick was surprised that I could do 18 push-ups at that time. So that's still one of my fondest memories of working with Shotgun. Um, but then as things evolved, it was with the company, what I realized is that it was a very, very collaborative experience, that everyone's voice was very important. We have an artistic company that's invited to attend to all of the rehearsals. And so uh, that's something that definitely drew me into the company. Fantastic. So you guys, uh, Carrie and Michael, Michael, your position is multifaceted. You've got you're called a dramaturg and you're called director of humanities. Mm -hmm. You want to tell us a little bit about your positions and how long you've been there? I came in uh, 2005, so I'll be starting my 13th season. And we're, we're already at work. I don't know. <laughs> the 
for a show, which is Hamlet. Um, uh, and <laughs> I, had, uh, I had met Carrie in 1988 in New York. She was running CSC. I was writing for a magazine called Theater Week, which maybe some of the older people in the room might remember. Uh, and I went down to CSC to interview her uh, for a production of uh, Birthday Party, which was the first professional production in America since the original 1967, I think. It was the first one that Pinter licensed. Uh, and I was incredibly blown away, first, by how articulate uh, and educated she was, because, you know, a lot of, a lot, not that many directors are so incredibly articulate about what they do. And they tend to be more articulate than actors. But, uh, but still, it, it was really astonishing to me. And then I saw the production, uh, and, and then several subsequent productions there, and was totally blown away by not just the intelligence, you know, which is what people think about, I think, when they think of Carrie, but the passion, you know. And um, one of the most beautiful, memorable, moving things I ever saw um, was uh, Carrie's production of Happy Days. Uh, at CSC, which was so beautiful and so heartbreaking and so moving. Uh, and yet, you know, it, it was also Beckett, you know, it, it was really something. So uh, in 2005, uh, the, uh, Paul Walsh, who was my predecessor, uh, had done 10 years. He was uh, moving on to Amherst to teach there. So the position was open. I applied for it. I'd been teaching at Columbia and State University of New York at Purchase and doing freelance dramaturgy. And uh, the stars just aligned, and uh, I came out. And it's uh, I'm one of the team that helps Carrie choose the plays we do. So, you know, like all of us, I read a thousand plays a year. Um, uh, I prepared dramaturgy for the actors and the other people on the art uh, on the artistic teams of, of productions. Uh, I do post-show discussions. I run a series of symposia. I write for our uh, publication, Words on Plays, which is a little book we do for every subscription show, which is really dramaturgy for the audience. I teach two courses a year in the MFA uh, program. Um, I do some development work also. I just came back from a week in New York with a group of, with a group of folks that we take uh, to see plays, and I'm kind of the talking head. So we talk about the plays, and I bring in people, and I interview them who are connected with the productions of the theater. Uh, you do all kinds of, I'm sure I've left something out, but it's, uh, as I say, every day is different, and which is one of the things that makes it fun, you know, and then I get to experience so many different facets of the organization in the conservatory where I'm one of the heads of faculty and on the artistic team, um, so I get a really sort of 360 degree view of, of what the operation is, and it's a really useful thing to be in those rooms, and um, it's useful to me, you know, both on the teaching side and on the uh, the producing side. I'd like to ask Carrie, why do you choose to have a dramaturg on staff and keep that position? Well, I'm a dramaturgy junkie. <laughs> um, I would have five dramaturgs, <laughs> although no one would be better than Michael. But I mean, um, I learned this from Irene Lewis. You know, Irene brilliantly ran Baltimore Center Stage for 20 years, and even in the rough times when they had to make a lot of cuts. She would do this manifesto and say, but there will always be two dramaturgs. Um, uh, and it was because, well, uh, you know, for me, I guess, um, you know, at heart, <laughs> um, everybody working in the theater has some pillar of the whole thing that they're sort of trying to sustain and hold up. But the most important pillar is really who is fighting for the work, pure and simple. Not because it will sell, not because it has a certain actor in it, not because blah, 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 but purely on the merits of the work. That's the dramaturg, or it should be. It isn't always, but it should be, right? And, and I'm not saying it's dispassionate in this emotional sense, but it's dispassionate in the sense that it, it is somebody in there fighting for that play or that language or that artist. And I think of dramaturgy as very supple. We do a lot of movement theater work, so dramaturgy, obviously, I know you've talked about that in this conference, doesn't just have to be about language. But, uh, you know, um, there is a magic in having that point of view, and I think it is not replicable. And I also think the fact that the dramaturg, like a kind of fish, swims in and out of the rehearsal and then in and out of the institution means there's a perspective that you don't have sitting 
inside the room, even though, I mean, I'm a very dramaturgical director, and I'm a writer, so I know how to think structurally about a play. But, for example, we just built a movement theater piece called Fatherville with Basil Twist and Stephen Fisher and a bunch of people. And uh, it came about in a very kind of inchoate, fun, odd way that these things often do. And then finally we had to put some structure to it, which I did, and we were working on it. And I said to Michael, would this was like two weeks ago, I said, um, would you walk by and be in the room with me for a little bit? And he was supposed to be deployed with the scripted plays, where he did amazing work with a group of playwrights. And he came in, we've worked together for so long, he came in to Fatherville for, you know, I don't know, 45 minutes. And he could look at it quite dispassionately and say a couple of things to me, one of which was so sort of obvious, but we hadn't, he said, you know, there's a lot of um, fear in this piece, and that's where the comedy comes from, the fear of fatherhood and and there's very little joy. Where is the joy of that experience? Which was so amazing to me since all of us had chosen to do it because we were interested in <laughs> the condition of it. But you know, you go down a deep dive with a group of people and there you are and suddenly somebody comes and says, how about this quality or how about that journey or what about, you know, um, it's amazing. So, you know, I think it's a real tragedy that uh, we have so few in-house dramaturgs because um, I think theater has become just expedient, you know, on a number of levels. That's why I'm really, I have to say, you know, it can't just be activism either. We're here, we are artists, we're here to make art, we are responsible to our art, and there's got to be somebody at the center of it who actually questions it and says, you know, you may think you're making a statement or you may think whatever, but is it good? Is it clear? Is it nuanced? Is it complicated? I mean, he'll challenge me all the time if I've made a choice that seems trivial, do you know, or seems not thought through, or that seems inchoate in some way, or if I'm obsessing about clarity at a moment where it's okay that it's messy and <laughs> ambiguous and that I should leave that alone and <laughs> let that be. Um, and I would just finally say he's really interested in actors, and I think it's beautiful when dramaturgs have an appetite for, I mean, they are our primary interpreters, they are usually treated as the least intelligent people in the room or the least collaborative people in the room, but in fact, because he teaches actors, he's trying to teach actors to think about what they are expressing thematically, emotionally, historically. What is it? What is the world of the play? Even if you update it, why was that impulse there? And those things are really gold. It makes for much more nuanced work. I think the dramaturg keeps us honest. <laughs> it's And remember the play. Yeah, provocative, and and I love that you guys have stuck together for so long, all four of you. You you have a trust, you have an innate sense of each other. You know when to say something, you know how to say it, <laughs> and you know how to hear it and how to take it. And that personal offense is kind of dissipated because it might have happened when you started working together, <laughs> but over time. Um, so one question, so for Patrick, do you feel dramaturgy permeating into other departments I or the ho how the whole company works by having a dramaturg on staff? Um, you were talking to me the other day about the how exciting the donors, when you're asking for money, it's a dramaturg or a dramaturgical sensibility, bringing the art into the question of give me some money, not just because I need money, <laughs> but here's the story we want to tell. Yeah, I'm. Um, I'm not sure if I'm going to answer your question, That's but okay. um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, I mean, I mean w well, one of the things that having a dramaturg in the room like, at every staff meeting and in every conversation that I have is that you know it also gives permission to other folks in the you know so if if so somebody comes working in the organization and they know Joni as the development director. But as a development director, she's then also talking about the play at a staff meeting or an organization on a certain level. Then the box office manager is also reading the play and doing research and digging up articles that are, are of interest to her in relationship to the play. And, and so is the, the managing director. And so is the production manager. And so the unit kind of having this, it, you know, Joni having, um, ha knowing that she's got the space to kind of bring, to, to bring that into the, um, and and those kind of conversations into the into our into our daily life also allows for other folks and then and then other folks want to be prepared for that and so I, I don't, I'm not 
I mean, Joni is definitely like our go-to company dramaturg, but I think that her uh, um, connection to the work, you know, also as a staff member has kind of helped to kind of like breed some other sort of like dramaturg juniors, you know, in the organization. So I would just kinda, I'm just kind of like saying there are people who want, yeah, they, but they just kind of, they want to, they also, they want to look at the, they want to just look at, dig deeper into the play. Um, I, I really appreciate Michael, like th that anecdote of Michael coming in and kind of the saying the thing about the, the, the father play because I, I you know, <laughs> Joni will come and watch a show and I'll be like, I kind of almost have to brace myself because like all the things, like okay, here it comes, here's all the things that I was hope I was I was blind I was not wanting to see because I'm trying to do this other thing, but I know all these things and I'm gonna get, you know, a five page email, a lot of with all caps, underlined, bold, <laughs> italics, like this has to get addressed, whatever. Um, that I know I need to hear. Like a lot of times as directors, I think a lot of directors we work with aren't used to getting so many notes <laughs> themselves. But our directors get a lot of notes. Um, and I, and it helps us it pushes us and 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 make and and makes the work better and uh yeah i mean i could go on and on but i mean I, I'm, I'm hoping that gets you what it you want yeah yeah. Sure, sure. yeah yeah and you guys you ha it's i specifically chose you guys cuz your companies are such different sizes and you've got maybe 5 7 times the staff size as you guys more, it's more probably. Because <laughs> they have an education program. Yeah, it's, you're it's, it's more a whole than, yeah, yeah. A th there's one other thing I wanted that, that I wanted to say earlier, and, and uh, uh, Carrie's point about um, how important it is that we focus on the work. Mm -hmm. and, and something we talk a lot about is, oh, we've all this fundraising stuff we have to do, all these other things we have to do, but if the play sucks, <laughs> then nothing else matters. <laughs> you know, and everything is easy when the play is good. And so I tell everybody, like, the most important thing that all of us are doing right now, it's all hands on deck, making this play the best it can be. And then everything else, box office, marketing, uh, all the, everything else just, just follows behind that. And I do think that while these other things, and I'm, an, I'm you know, I'm an activist as well. You know, I'm going to say, like, those are important things for me. But my primary job is to make sure that we're making a really, we're, that we're telling the most important story when it's supposed to be told and um, with the best people and g it's getting all the support that it needs to happen. And then all those other things can happen, then all those other things just like roll out. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, and uh, you know, that, that this is your tool to do all those other things that you want to do, mm -hmm. that play. You guys, uh, so it's been 19 years together? Okay. So, 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 no, 18, 18 years, years, okay? Okay, that's fine. I didn't know. Oh, my God. Well, actually, we met in 1998. One year difference. 98 was when you came to see um, The Odyssey and Richard III. Okay. Um, yeah. I wanted to ask Joni, do you have a favorite project <laughs> with Patrick? And it could be even as, as the development person or as a rehearsal moment or something funny at a board meeting or... A donor event. Don't, don't just point the <laughs> <laughs> Those, Those just aren't. Those <laughs> they really aren't funny. <laughs> yeah, that's the hoot They're funny <laughs> afterwards if you've you know thought about it for a while. Um, we've collaborated on so many projects. There's been so many. Um, the one that was probably one of the most ambitious was when we decided to present Tom Stoppard's uh, Coast of Utopia trilogy. And that was a three-year journey. We opened each show separately and then ran all of them in repertory, which was just an amazing experience. And as a research junkie, that was certainly such a wonderful journey to uh, create resources for all of the actors. And it's also a, a good learning experience that when you have whether it's a small cast or a large cast, you're going to have some actors that are really hungry for a lot of information, and you have other actors that are, you know, not so much and being really respective that, you know, of course that's totally fine. So one of the things that I would try to do is create an individual packet for each of those characters in that mammoth uh, trilogy so that there was something very specific for each character and then providing additional information for those that were really hungry for it. And then it that was also a particularly interesting process, attending all of the rehearsals, 
so that because you never really knew where there there were some scenes where people were just really eager to just dig in and fly with it and then sometimes the the rehearsal would stop for a moment because there would be a kernel of I don't understand this reference and then needing to stop and have a 45 minute conversation, sometimes an hour conversation in a very short rehearsal period, but really important conversations. So I think pro that's one that certainly stands out partially because of its sort of grand uh, epic scope and the idea of are we going to be able to do this? Are we going to be able to do this play that has you know 70 parts with 29 actors and fill that stage and are we actually going to be able to do a marathon and do three plays in our tiny space all in one day and uh, and it was a really exhilarating experience to be part of that. It's fantastic and Gary and Michael you know Stoppard well and um, you've shown us this thing of Arcadia do you want to talk about your collaboration on Arcadia or anything? Well I mean that I think there are two productions that come to mind if I was going to name my two favorites in terms of the process. Uh, first of all, it's always, it's always great to be in the room with Carrie for lots of reasons. And, and I think a, a lot of you will understand when I say maybe the most valuable to me is that I know that I'll be listened to and that I will be, and that what I'm my, in my attempt to be helpful will be appreciated because that isn't always the case, you know. I mean, you probably have all had experiences where you've been with a director who you've said something to and they've kind of looked at you and gone, okay, now. <laughs> you know, yeah, that we love that. You know, and, and you do that for three <laughs> weeks and that's really hard. It's a great play. You can never really emotionally and well as intellectually. Uh, and because, you know, it is something that Carrie does as well, if not better, than almost anybody in this country. You know, and she has a relationship with him that goes back a long way uh, that makes a difference as well. And th just the joy of being in that room every day, wrestling, watching, you know, really talented people wrestle with that material, you know, and, uh, was and, and you know, seeing it happen from the ground up was incredibly rewarding. And be to be able to contribute, you know, to that process was also incredibly rewarding. Uh, and it, that's true on every stopper th that I've worked on with Carrie. Uh, and the other one, I think, uh, probably was Endgame uh, that we did it, uh, the, with Bill Irwin uh, as Ham. And uh, Carrie made a really interesting choice for Clove, uh, who he was cast much younger than is often cast. He was a graduate of our MFA program, Nick Gabriel, uh, who then went on to teach with us uh, both in the MFA program and the, and the education program and be an, an actor in the company. Uh, to wrestle with that material and try to figure out often line to line what actually was going on. And then we were doing it on, um, on a double bill with play, which is a really terrifying play for three actors, I'm sure you know, where you it goes at lightning speed, there's no pauses, uh, so you know, and if you get lost, you're screwed. Um, <laughs> you know, and it's, it's the play where there are three people in urns and then there's a light on each one. And one of the really fascinating things that happened in rehearsal one day, uh, we had fixed lights on each actor, in rehearsal, and we had blacked out the room. So whenever, you know, whenever an actor's cue was, you know, his light would go on or her light would go on. And it was coming along, but it seemed kind of, there was something missing, and we couldn't quite puzzle out exactly what it was that was keeping the play from really coming to life. Uh, and then uh, one of the lights or two of the lights just failed. They went out. And so Elisa Guthards, who was our fabulous stage manager, said, well, I'll just do it manually. I'll, have, I'll do it with one light and go back and forth. And all of a sudden, that light became a character, and the play came to life. You know? <laughs> but being, being in, in those rooms you know, with really great material uh, and, and people you know, who know it and love it and know how to work with actors and one of the great things about working with Carrie is that she really loves to collaborate, you know, and I haven't worked with that many artistic directors who, when they say, I love to collaborate, actually mean it, you know. <laughs> it's like when you meet an English person in England and they say, come over for dinner, you know they don't really mean it, you know. Uh, it's, <laughs> uh, but to work with someone who really craves collaboration is a gift, and it makes you, it makes you better because you walk into the room knowing 
that even though you're, you're not always going to agree, and none of you note that I'm going to give Carrie is going to be useful to her, but I know that they're going to be considered, and that I'm part of a team that's making something work, and that is the most gratifying thing to me about this job. Thank you. That's fantastic. Carrie, I think you, uh, can I ask you a tougher question? What do you do when you disagree, when you can't find a resolution, or is it easier knowing him so well? Uh you know, I, I mean, the funny thing when you make a piece of work is that nobody wins. Do you know what I mean? Like, <laughs> you know, so it's not about that. Um, you know in your gut when there's a moment or an arc of a play or something that is um, that doesn't feel muscular when you see it happening in the room. That feels flaccid or it feels um, predictable or it feels uninteresting or it feels unfulfilled or unclear or, you know, your gut tells you the event happening in front of you isn't as electric as it could be, right? And so, you know, there's no one way to solve that. I mean, that's what's sort of amazing. You know, sometimes it's a design problem. Sometimes it's an acting problem. Sometimes it's, you know, um, a script problem. Sometimes it's a directing problem. And, you know, the more you work in the theater, the more you're able to isolate those things. Um, the really vulnerable thing, and I'll tell you, it's so interesting. It's one thing to be a director with a dramaturg, and it's another thing to be a playwright, um, which is even much more vulnerable, and particularly when you're the artistic director, right? Because nobody will really tell you anything. <laughs> true. <laughs> and you spend your life saying, tell me the truth. What do you see? And... Um, Michael did some work with me, again, this was very recently on a new play of mine called The Fit. And um, this is where long-term relationships are kind of great. So we had, he dramaturged Major Barbara that Dennis Garnham did. We do a lot of work with the Canadians. And it went to Canada. Um, and I never th have thought of myself as a Shavian. I've, it's not ever been my favorite material, which is not to say it's not great writing. Um, you know, every director falls in love with certain things. I come from the Greeks, that's what I love. You know, and if I'm going to do a play from that peri from the Shaw period, I'd much rather do Granville Barker, whom I, th in some ways, think is the greater writer. So, you know, but I learned an enormous amount watching Michael and Dennis work on Major Barbara, um, and duke out the ways in which to make the dialectic between Undersheft and Barbara as um, muscular in that last act as possible. So I, that sort of woke me up to something. And so we're working on the fit, and we're sitting in my office, and Michael says about the end of the play. It should be much more Shavian. Um, and I sort of thought, he said, you know, the, the um, it has to be an impossible, I mean, to make it really interesting, he said, from his point of view, it should be an impossible choice at the end. It's about a venture capital firm and an Indian woman and a, and a white guy who she works for, and she goes off to work for a firm that's run by a um, compatriot of hers, by an Indian, um, which is much more misogynistic than the firm she left, but it's sort of about tribalism versus diversity and where we feel at home and why we make those choices. And Michael said, don't make it an easy choice. You know, and at first I sort of thought, well, I don't know if it's an easy choice. And then the way I heard him talking about it, it was exactly the same language and thinking and thoughtfulness that he used on Major Barber. And I could go away having done that experience where I was much more an observer. I was the producer on Major Barber. It wasn't my show and take it right back into my play, and it made it a much more interesting play. So, you know, so that's not really about agreeing or disagreeing, but, but about, um, you know, sort of thinking, why did he see it that way? Um, now, of course, the great thing if you have multiple dramaturgs is you get multiple <laughs> points of view. So, for instance, when I had Bea also, Beatrice Chibasso and Michael, what was beautiful about that is not that they disagreed, but that the things that caught their eyes were very different. <laughs> so the kind of notes they gave were totally different. They weren't replicative one to the other. They were just really different. And so, of course, then, as a director, you have to go away and think, which of these notes can I put into effect? Which do I want to put into effect? You know, what do I agree with? And that's your journey. But it seems to me when you have that kind of eye in the room, you have to accept that that's what they saw. And that's the most useful thing, right? I saw this. Is that what you wanted me to see? And that's a great question. Then the director has to go back and think, is that what I want you to see? So Patrick and Joni, you, so like you were saying, 
Michael sometimes is a dramaturg when you're a director or when you're a playwright, and you sometimes wear the hat of a development director, and sometimes you're in rehearsal as a dramaturg. Oh, and as a director, right, right, right. So um, how is it, do you guys feel you change your relationship if you're in a different situation? When you're the dramaturg and he's the director, or when you're his development director and you're in a staff meeting, do you find that your relationship changes or the way you speak to one another, or is it all fluid? <laughs> You're a different situation because there's fewer people around anyway. You all do everything, I guess. I don't know that there's a strong difference, and it's partially because we've just we've worked together for such a long time in so many different roles, and our roles are very different on a really a, mm -hmm. a daily basis. And mm -hmm. there's never a day where the work isn't central in some way, shape, or, or other, whether we're talking about the play that we're choosing, whether we're talking about fundraising, that's always sort of the center. I do feel that uh, th if I am, uh, and this is for me, it was particularly evident with Coast of Utopia because we would go from working our sort of day-to-day -day job, you know, nine to five, and then going to rehearsal. That for me, there there was a shift, not necessarily in how we communicated, but that uh, it just felt really wonderful to be the sole focus was the work and whereas in our day-to-day -day relationship that there there are you know it's it's a little bit like the uh the film up with you know where the dogs <laughs> see a squirrel that there's so many different things that you're that you're uh, having to address on a daily basis but i don't know that that for me that the relationship is different or i don't know if you yeah No idea how That's to okay. answer. I'm, you know what I would say. I mean, th th briefly, what I would say is that if we're having a meeting around the office and we're having a conversation, we will go down a rabbit hole for something for an hour. You know, mm -hmm. depending on if there's a grant deadline coming or whatever's going on. Whereas if we try not to do that in a rehearsal space, so if Joni feels really strongly about something and knowing that this could be a longer conversation. Like uh, I'll know that we're gonna have an I'll have an email later or mm -hmm. we'll have a conversation outside because sometimes it's not we can kind of geek out on the handkerchief and something like that and what we really need <laughs> finished is staging Act Two Scene One you know yeah, yeah, um, yeah. and so I think Joni That's was true. like I'll you know we'll we'll get to that later um, and and as far as like disagreeing because I'm really interested in that. Mm -hmm. You know, and I find myself a lot of times also as an artistic director giving notes to another director, and someone feels very strongly about a decision that they're making, and, and also Joni with me. You know, a lot of times I really, again, also try to hear, you know, and you're getting different points of view. Mm -hmm. um, and 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 they're, they're seeing something, their interpretation of what is not working for them might be completely different for some person. It's about the costume, about the staging, about the light cue. There's something in that moment that's not working, and they're trying to interpret it through what their their experience is. And I think I think I find that with Joni, a lot of times we will. There are certain things that I know that she'll, I can I know that she's not gonna like, and and uh, and my first reaction was like I'm gonna just change whatever. I mean Joni, you know, when we first started working together. It's like, well, she's so much smarter than me, and so she has this idea. So we're gonna do that. But it ends up kind of being like this kind of weird collage thing. And so a lot of times what I'm trying to do is, okay, I hear what she's saying. I'm not sure that I agree with that solution, mm -hmm. but I, I, I respect the fact that something's not working and how can I try to like um, figure out a way to kind of solve it within the framework that we've been building, you know? And, and that's something that, that I think we would, and often a lot of times you just have to like let go of certain things. I have to let go of certain notes with Mark Jackson. If I'm really disagreeing with something, it's better in the long term for me <laughs> just to give it up, you know, because I'm going to be working with this person for a long time. And since I'm like, okay, well, I just we're going to just agree to disagree, <laughs> and we're going to do it. I'm not going to like say you must do it this way. It's like you know, it's okay, you know, just trust it. So we'll do that with each other. No, no, <laughs> I just no, no, I just wanted to add something, which agree. is that no, 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 but just the importance too of it being able to have the experience of having different roles because then when I directed a show, having the flip side of experiencing what it's like, especially because we have an artistic company with you have people giving you multiple points of view and then how do you na navigate that when you are directing a show 
and you know you can't really direct uh, you can't direct by committee but ultimately you have to really know what message are you trying to tell what story do you really want to tell are the notes helping you tell that story and Patrick actually has a something that he'll often tell directors you know he'll f he might feel very strongly about something but he'll also say okay this is this is the third time I've given this note and I I'm not seeing that there that you want to change it, and so there there will be a point where he'll let it go, and say, okay, so pr this person has a, a different opinion. So, but there is something too about being able to experience things from different points of view and acknowledging, you know, when a person is a director, getting so much feedback, you know, what's the best way of communicating that I'll so it's actually that. useful. I'll tell you one other thing. I just made me think about it from Testament. Um, you know. There were three versions of Testament when we did it. There was the novel, and then there was the play that was originally done, and then there was the play that Deborah Warner took apart and put back together with Fiona Shaw. And Colm Trudine said to us, do whichever one you want. So it's also <laughs> really interesting when the dramaturg has real skin in the game because Michael and I kind of did the version we wanted together, right? So we took with Shauna McKenna because Michael's really interested in acting. <laughs> so, you know, and if you want to work with Shauna, she's a powerhouse. And so... By the time we went to rehearsal, we'd all made the draft of it together. Um, and so, you know, we had all a lot of skin in the game. We knew why we had chosen what we had chosen. Then we commissioned a play from Colm Chardine, which was really tough because he's a novelist and he's a genius and he's not a playwright. And then Michael and I had to look at each other like, how do we give these notes? <laughs> how do you give the note to a genius novelist to say, this scene has no motive? Okay, but that's or you know, that's how we talk in the theater, right? Yeah. Theater is about action. I, you know, how does this scene lead to that scene? The dominoes aren't falling. So we found, I don't know, maybe you want to talk about it. All the vocabulary we usually use amongst ourselves to m push a project forward was really hard with someone we loved and admired enormously, but whose sense of structure and writing and everything was radically different because he was a novelist. And we had a lot of fat meetings. <laughs> <laughs> it, was a it was a little oh, surprising no. to me because although, you know, Testament was first a play before he made it into a novella, it was a, it's a monologue, but, uh, but theatrically it's brilliant, you know, and he, to and he really loved the version that we put together from the three existing ones. He made a couple little tiny tweaks. I think he wanted us to add a w to add the back into one sentence in initially, <laughs> which we didn't do. I don't think <laughs> actually, because um, there was no reason to do it. Um, um, but so yeah, so when it came to this project, which was an adaptation of a of a of a Henry James novella, we thought, well, this will be fine. But in fact, all the instincts that he had on Testament completely deserted him. And he had a very, very good, very skilled, experienced director, you know, who was, who was part of the project. It was really hard to talk about that play in, in language that would be useful to him, you know, in language that he understood in terms of action and, uh, you know, and stakes and, and, and real-time kinds of things and how to keep the action moving uh, was really, you know, and in the end it just, it was heartbreaking, but in the end it just didn't work. And, you know, luckily, as a dramaturg, it's not my job <laughs> to say to this world-famous novelist, you know, we're just going to have to move on. <laughs> <laughs> bad guy, <laughs> good cop, bad cop. <laughs> <laughs> do, you guys, do you guys have some questions for us? Yes, okay. Ken? We're, you're getting a mic. I'm getting your mic, Nikisa. <laughs> uh, my name's uh, Ken Tranilia, he, him, his. I'm uh, currently the president of LMDA, um, and I really want to thank you all for being here. I know how busy you are, and it's a beautiful Saturday, so even if you were off today, <laughs> thank you for coming to be here. It's really meaningful for us to have not only leaders in, in the local theater economy, but nationally and internationally come to our conference and speak about the value of, uh, of dramaturgy in your organizations, but also the people who engage in that work and investing in that. Um, and so uh, on behalf of my colleagues who are here, but also um, watching eagerly on HowlRound, um, thank you. Uh, yes, hi. 
No, it's a re it's really valuable conversation and resource. Um, part of the the reason why we're gathered here in this space and for this conference is to really engage in conversations about access, activism, um, equity, diversity, and inclusion. And so, uh, within the context of this conversation, I mean, it's 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 awesome to see the optics of gender equity being <laughs> being evident on this stage. Um, but how do you um, how are you currently in your institutions grappling with equity and inclusion um, in the work that you do, in the hiring that you do? And if you could just speak to that maybe a little bit. Um, and what's, what's most pressing for you, but what's most pressing for the field that we can help um, you know, take away and this organization can support for the work to be done? Thank you. Well, you know, the gender piece of it, I, I feel like I've been fighting for <laughs> my whole career and I really you know, some ways thought we would have solved some of these problems. Um, in ways that we still haven't, but we just finished at ACT collaborating with the wonderful Wellesley Centers for Women on a big project called the Women's Leadership Project, which if you, uh, thank you HowlRound, who was incredibly helpful on that, P. Carl particularly, um, but which is accessible if you just go on Wellesley's website or, or ACT's, you can click on the Wellesley Centers for Women. It's a, it's a study that um, um, uses a very particular demographic, which is Lort Theaters, not to privilege Lort Theaters, but just because it's a database that was useful to sort of look much more broadly at why we still have such a hard time imagining women leading organizations, <laughs> both as artistic directors and executive directors. Um, um, and so, you know, that's been really fascinating because obviously I've, I've, I've thought about that forever um, and it matters for multiple reasons that to me uh, have to do with um, the richness of the work, which is where I think about the EDI work coming into play. Um, I am first and foremost an artist, not an activist, and I say that because um, I feel like that's what I can contribute. Those are the tools um, that I can contribute best. And so I'm always looking for nuance. <laughs> I'm looking for arguments that collide that lead us to better thinking. So I tend to have a sort of allergy towards propaganda in a big way. Um, but the flip side, so, but the flip side is, you know, the thing about being an artistic director, and that's why it matters that more kinds of people are artistic directors, is that ultimately you are the gatekeeper. You are the one that gets to choose what work gets done. So really early on in my career, I thought, I'm never gonna produce, you know, that play Sylvia about a woman who wants to be a dog. I mean, I just don't have to do those plays. I don't have to do them. And I can actually say, we're just not gonna do it, you know? I mean, I have lists of plays. We used to have a joke at ACT that we had certain playwrights with lines through them, and that was our mission statement. Like, we just don't have to do these plays. I mean, it's such a relief because I thought, I need it. I thought, I'm only ever gonna do plays that have three-dimensional women. They don't have to be heroic, they don't have to be kind, but they have to be three-dimensional, and they have to be somewhere in the middle of the play. Um, I always have felt that way, which is why, ironically, although I'm sort of a classicist at heart, and I come out of the Greek, I've done so much more Greek tragedy and, and French than Shakespeare because Shakespeare's always 12 men and two women. And I got so weary of seeing these two women sit patiently around the edge of the rehearsal room while the guys got to run the show. Um, and so, um, so what, I mean, what can I say? You know, it's, um, you have to start with education. You have to start by telling as many kinds of stories as possible. Um, so ACT has a, you know, really broad educational mission. Um, and a really broad citizen artistry mission in our MFA program, which means that issues not just about race and gender, but about class and about voice come into it. I would just say this, because it's my big bugbear, we were talking about this before. I am so tired of English first. Everything that we as Americans think the only language in the world people speak, speak is English. So I'm tired of just hyphenate culture being considered diversity. Um, and I think we do this in the American theater constantly. We think it's diverse if it's Asian American, but we're not really interested in Asian, like what is Chinese literature look like, or Japanese literature, or Vietnamese literature. You know, we're woefully I ignorant about Spanish work. Um, yeah, and we're on, uh, that's on our border. And how many people know about Mexican dramaturgy or Mexican plays? We're really myopic that way. Um, even people really involved in activism do not seem interested in the way people think globally and that is represented in language. And if you're a dramaturg, you have to be interested in language. And the thing about language is you can express things in one language that are inexpressible in another language, and that's the joy of translation. 
and at Lambda and at these conferences, people used to talk about translation. I find that conversation has disappeared. It's as if languages are too hard to learn. Why would anybody learn a language? You know, that is activism. You want to actually think about global theater, try and encounter people in a language that is not your own, and you will find it the most humbling experience of your life. Okay, that's all. So I think one way you guys are activists is recently you did a season of wim all women playwrights, and I know Ellen Da and our dramaturgs are big fans of the Kilroy list. And uh, I can you play the next slide? We do have your graphic work on on that season. There you go for a whole season. <laughs> so I don't know. That may be something. That well, I think. Uh, uh, there are two things that I'll speak to very quickly, and then uh, Patrick, you can uh, jump in. But with the season of women playwrights, there were there were so many. There were we felt like there were a lot of conversations about the lack of women playwrights, the lack of gender parity, and so our after having a lot of conversations about it, we thought, well, let's just let's just stop talking, let's just do something, and so that's why we decided to present a season not only of main stage. A season of women playwrights. We also started a staged reading series, so uh, which we still have. But that particular season, we had the main stage season of women playwrights, and we also had a staged reading series, also of women playwrights. And part of the reason for that, you know, one of the arguments that you'll find is that, well, you can't really do a season of women playwrights because there's just not that many. And we actually found the opposite problem, which was part of the reason that we had all women playwrights for the staged reading series as well, that there were so many plays that it became, you know, you know there, were, there were challenges as to what we were going to do because there were so many wonderful plays to choose from. And do you choose classic plays? Do you choose new, new plays? That was also another whole conversation. But also, moving forward, we're very cognizant of having women playwrights uh, representative, of having diverse voices represented. But I will say something too about Shotgun in general. We, we're just down the street, we're so we're in an area that is also a neighborhood. And when we moved to our theater in 2004, you know, it's a diverse area. And so we thought, well, we'll just have an open house and invite people in. And that's not enough. That's no one came. Who are who are we? You know, the brand new theater company. So instead, uh, since 2004, we've done three community-based plays where we've gone out into our community. What stories do you want to tell? What's important to you? And then hire a playwright to then craft those stories together. So, and we've talked about this in our most recent company retreat as well, of really needing to get out into the community more. We were recently a sponsor for the Juneteenth Festival that just happened last week. Um, so I think part of it is not only making the commitment to represent diverse voices, but it's so important also to get out of your house. Uh, that's one thing we're very passionate about, of trying to get out more into the communities. And uh, at the Juneteenth Festival, we handed out free ticket vouchers for our current show, Brownsville Song. And we've had a lot of people just who have walk been walking by our theater be and noticing the murals for years who are now coming in the door because we made the, an effort to actually go out and meet people. So I think that that's also something that's very important to do. I mean, that's great. Um, yeah, the, the one thing I'll say, yeah, Joan, th there was a, we, have a we have a company meeting the first Sunday of every month. We have a group of 20 folks, there's actors, directors, you know, playwrights, uh, stage managers, we all kind of come together and just talk about what's happening. And something had come up with the Guthrie, their 50th anniversary, did this whole season of plays by white guys, and people were like, this is wrong. And and like, oh, well I'm gonna write a blog, I'm writing a letter to the editor, we're gonna do an article on HowlRound. It's like, you know, I am not a blogger, I am not a HowlRounder. I mean, sorry, HowlRound. <laughs> there it is, right? There it is. But uh, I just felt like, well, why don't we just like do, why don't we just do, and just start, have that be part of our conversation. And the interesting thing for me was actually going home and like later that week, and ha I have three daughters, and making them breakfast in the morning, and it's like, you know, oh, we're doing this thing, well, let's go on at work, Daddy. Well, we're gonna do a whole season of plays by women. And they were just like, so? I mean, and I was like, yes, I want it to be like, so that people are like, she did a whole season of plays by women. All right, do you want a medal for that? <laughs> you know, <laughs> you know, give a pass the Cheerios. But you know, when I was telling some of the older audiences that we were doing that, they're like, that's just, that's insane. It's like, but. You know, so just the fact that it would be 
a way to kind of just shift the um, conversation. And as the and as and as Carrie had mentioned earlier, like our jobs as artistic directors, the one thing that we really have the final stamp on is like, what are the stories that you're telling? What are you gonna? What are you saying about? You know, what do you want to talk about with your community right now? Those plays are our conversation starter, you know, and um, and 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 what we what what we're choosing, the way that we're choosing to engage with our community by who's telling the story says a lot about who we are. Hi there, uh, Claire Martin, she, her, hers. Um, I'm just curious, you've talked a lot about sort of the process of working as a director, dramaturg duo. I'm wondering what happens after the show is closed? Is there some sort of like post-show conversation that happens? Uh, do you talk to each other about what you learned during the process, how to move forward? Like what happens after the show closes? Oh, uh, yeah, well, you know, we have an artistic team meeting every week. We're always talking about what we did, sometimes months later, and uh, we just, uh, did uh, we commissioned an adaptation of the novel Thousand Splendid Sons? Uh, the, the the playwright was a, a woman named uh, Ursula Rani Sarma, uh, who did an astonishing job, and that's that was like a three-year process to get it up to production, and it's going to we're going to do it again, and it's going to visit some other theaters, and it's all been it's always being it's always being tinkered on, it's always being worked on. We did it first last spring, then it went up to Calgary, uh, and uh, Carrie continued to work on it there, including uh, some script revisions. Uh, there'll be more revisions when, we, when it comes back. Um, it never kind of ends, you know, in a way. That and they'll, they'll particularly, you know, th the plays that nec don't necessarily work as well as you wanted them to, or work in a different way than you wanted them to, are the ones that are often the most fruitful in, in discussion as, as time goes on, you know. Um, Someone said, I know that I know that Bill Ball, who founded ACT, said it, but many people have said, you don't learn a lot from your successes. You know. You learn most you learn most from the things that don't succeed or succeed as fully as you hoped that they would. You know. Uh, and you know, we we do a lot of thinking and a lot of talking about the work that we do before we do it. You know, it's it's one of the few theaters I've ever worked at where there's a lot of debate about why we're doing this play. Why this play now, which ought to be you know, the question that every theater asks, but in the theaters that I'd worked at before coming here, it was never asked, except, you know, where's the funding coming from question. Um, we talk a lot about why we do the plays that we do and, uh, and what, we've, what we've learned as artists doing them. You know. I'll just say in the theme of this conversation, this thing about the duos, you know, that when you have a collaborator over a long period of time, and you work with certain artists over a period of time, what can happen is that the conversation after the show becomes incredibly rich because it's the prelude to the next one. You know, So for instance, we built a dance theater piece called The Tosca Project with five ballet dancers and five actors. And, um, and it, that's a really hard and interesting kind of dramaturgy. And what we learned ultimately from that, we, we the, from much discussion afterwards about how that got built, we then in some ways um, took right into Fatherville, for instance, or do you know it, it happens um, in lots of cases that that you you carry over that conversation and the things that were the ahas, the things you wish you'd done differently, the things that you did that really helped. Certainly with Stoppard, you know that those dramaturgy conversations are kind of ongoing ones. That's why the long-term relationship is useful. Long-term relationships are with playwrights and. We also learn a shorthand, and we, we also end up transforming each other artistically in artistic ways. And um, I just want to thank you for hiring dramaturgs, for being interested in dramaturgs, for loving and nurturing your dramaturgs, <laughs> <laughs> and for them you know, hanging on and making each other better. So thank you for your Saturday morning. We really appreciate it. And thank you all of you and HowlRound. <laughs> And go see shows at ACT 